Welcome to podcast number 25 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to look at religion in the colonies. Religion can be a touchy subject, and the religious history of the colonies is long and complicated because it is part of a much bigger story that was unfolding in Europe and that involved many different people, religious doctrines, and events in politics. In order to keep this podcast moving and listenable, I will only focus on the big events and main points of the story. And while I never shy away from the facts, no matter where they lead, I will do my best to steer clear of the religious controversies that still rankle some people. At the time the colonies were founded, there was no separation of church and state. Church and state were part of each other. Both church and religion were considered a function of state. That's how things were in Europe. It is true that many people came to the colony seeking religious freedom, and many found it, but it is important to remember that most of the colonies had an official church or religion that was supported by tax money. What I have described here is much different than what modern Americans experience. Today, the United States is a land of religious freedom. There is no national church in the United States, nor are Americans forced to belong to any church or to worship in a manner prescribed by the government. Religious freedom and a tolerance for multiple religions are the heritage of Americans, but it was not always that way. For most of the colonial period, the colonists were not free to worship as they chose. Tolerance for multiple religions was slow in developing. However, the Protestant Reformation, as it was unfolding in Europe, produced numerous Protestant denominations, many of which ended up in the North American colonies. The fact that there were so many denominations floating around in the colonies, many of which were persecuted at first by the colonial authorities, and the fact that social structures in the colonies tended to be much less rigid than in England, probably ensured that at some point there would be religious tolerance. For everyone to get along, there would have to be. In order to understand the religious situation in the colonies, we have to understand how the Protestant Reformation unfolded in England, because it carried over into the colonies. During the Middle Ages, the relationship between England and the Roman Catholic Church were sometimes rocky. After all, Rome, where the Pope lived, was so far away from England. The English people resented having to pay taxes to support the church. The king and the nobility sometimes resented that the Catholic Church owned so much land in England. In fact, almost a third of the land in England was under control of the Catholic Church. And also, the Catholic Church had its own court system for some offenses. Both the fact that they owned so much land and had their own court system were irritants to the king and the nobility because these were important sources of money that the king and the nobles were not able to tap into. There was also widespread dissatisfaction with the worldliness and corruption of the Catholic clergy. Scandals, like the brothel set up in London for the clergy, didn't help matters either. We're all familiar a little bit with the story of King Henry VIII. I talked about him quite a bit in my podcast number two. King Henry wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, but the Pope wouldn't let him. Henry wanted to marry the woman he was having an affair with, Anne Boleyn. Henry also lusted after all the land that the Catholic Church owned in England. He dreamed of owning it himself and being able to sell it. Being a strong-headed king, Henry simply broke away from the Catholic Church. He announced that he would from now on be head of the church in England, which is exactly what he did. He divorced his wife, and of course the Pope promptly excommunicated Henry for his actions, which didn't seem to bother the English people all that much. Henry did something else that was extremely important. He authorized the translation of the Bible into plain English and had a copy put in each one of the parish churches. People now could go and read for themselves or have someone read it to them, passages of the Bible, in plain English. Up until this point, the Bible had always been in Latin. In fact, it was not legal for Bibles to be translated into the common languages of Europe. The popes had always opposed the Bible being translated into common languages. Pope Gregory VII wrote this. He said, It is clear to those who reflect upon it that not without reason has it pleased Almighty God that Holy Scriptures should be a secret in certain places, lest if it were plainly apparent to all men, perchance it would be little esteemed and be subject to disrespect, or it might be falsely understood by those of mediocre learning and lead to error. Having the Bible translated into plain English was a game changer. I would go as far as to say that it might be one of the most important events to occur in Western civilization. Bible reading became so popular that Henry had to quickly put new regulations into place limiting who and when it could be read, but really the cat was out of the bag. The Bible fed the Reformation. Protestants who read it could look at the Church of England and see that the way things were going in the Church of England didn't match what they saw happening in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Protestants looked to the Bible as the ultimate source of authority in doing God's work, whereas Catholics and even the Church of England continued to look to their liturgy and the church hierarchy as a source of authority. This is an important distinction that still rings true today. 
Having the Bible translated into English also led to divisions. As people began reading it carefully and studying it carefully, they began picking up on different verses and beginning to interpret them differently from each other. In some ways, this process is still continuing today, and I have to think that maybe the Catholic Church's clergy, higher clergy at that time, probably derived some satisfaction in saying, see, we told you so. This would happen if you let the Bible be common to everyone to read. Had the Bible not been translated into plain English for the people to read, I'm not certain that the United States would exist today. And if it did, it certainly wouldn't be in the form that it is. It was really a game changer in so many ways. When Henry died in 1547, his son Edward became king. Edward was a young boy and he was in bad health. He didn't last very long, but during his reign, he was a Protestant who continued the Protestant Reformation in England. Edward died in 1553 and his half-sister Mary took the throne. Mary was a thorough Catholic who felt that the Protestant reformers were heretics and needed to be quashed. She began the process of trying to return England to Catholicism. During Mary's short reign, she burned at the stake alive over 300 Protestants who died in the eyes of the people as martyrs. Simply reading the Bible in English was punishable by death. Queen Mary's reign was so infamous that she's now known to history as Bloody Mary. There were long-term consequences for Mary's actions. Many Protestants fled England and went to the continent at this time, where other reformers who had already been at work for some time were living, such as John Calvin and Martin Luther, Later, when Mary died, these other Protestants brought back the things they had learned on the continent to England, and it was a heavy influence for the Protestant Reformation in England later. Also, the English people began at this time to identify Catholicism and the Pope with arbitrary and oppressive government. This was a very important theme that carried over into the colonies, especially in the New England. This also does a lot to explain why it was that from New Hampshire in the north all the way to Georgia, the southernmost colony, it was illegal for Catholics to vote or hold office. Colonists who were Protestants by and large were afraid the Catholics would gain control and then oppress them as Mary had done. There was so much animosity towards the Catholic Church and the papacy that every year in Boston they would burn popes in effigy. In 1558, Mary died and her half-sister Elizabeth became queen. Elizabeth was a thorough Protestant but she also wanted to settle things down in the kingdom. She took kind of a moderate course. England would be Protestant, but Catholics were basically tolerated. Keep in mind at this time that it was illegal not to go to church. If you lived in England and you were an Englishman, you were required every week to attend what they called divine services at the Church of England. Failure to attend could be punished. And criticisms of the higher clergy, such as Anglican bishops or so forth, could be punished quite severely. There were extreme cases where one man had his nose slit, he had his ears cut off, and he had his cheeks branded, though I suspect that was one of the more extreme cases. The Protestant Reformation was still in full swing, but religious toleration was still a ways off. People were still reading the Bible and still comparing what they read in the Bible to what they saw in the Church of England. And in many instances, they weren't liking what they saw. Many of these people decided they could work within the church by simply going to church and continuing to try and pressure for reforms, and others felt that it was their religious duty to not go to church, but to just completely dissent from it. These are the people that we know of as like the pilgrims that came to Plymouth that we always associate with the Thanksgiving dinner. Many people resorted to having makeshift type church meetings in their homes where they could read the Bible, talk about it, and come up with their own interpretations and and understandings of it. There was still lots of controversy about many aspects of the church. For example, infant baptism. Many dissenters pointed out that in the New Testament, children were not baptized, and what baptisms did occur were not by sprinkling. For example, Jesus himself was baptized by immersion and not by sprinkling. Another source of contention were the vestments that the priests wore. Again, people reading the Bible would look at that and say there was no biblical authorization for priests to be wearing priestly vestments. One of the biggest sources of consternation occurred over what's called the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper that was administered at the church. The Catholic view, and it was also the view of the Church of England, was that once the priest blessed the bread and wine, those things literally turned into the flesh and blood of Christ. Protestant dissenters said that no, the bread and wine were simple representations of the flesh and blood of Christ to help the followers remember their duty to follow Christ. During this time, a broad range of people could be called Puritans. This word doesn't refer to just one group. When we think of Puritans, we think of the people coming to Plymouth 
and having Thanksgiving or the first settlers of Boston. But really the word Puritan meant all of many different groups and denominations that were still in the infant stages of formation that felt that the Church of England hadn't done enough to purify itself from Catholic influence. They disliked all the mythology that they and superstition that they perceived that was still going on. Things like someone claiming to have a container of the Virgin Mary's milk, another one claiming to have a relic, a piece of the cross. These things were still floating around in England. Various denominations that we know of today of Protestants were beginning to form at this time. Groups that we now know of as Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Quakers, Baptists, Seekers, and a few others, some of which died out or merged with others. Presbyterians looked at the Bible and in their mind, they completely denied that there needed to be a bishopric. They felt that each congregation should be under the control of local elders. Congregationalists went even further. They felt that each congregation should select its own preachers and that the sermons and teachings should be rooted firmly in the Bible and in expounding the Bible. The Congregationalists ended up being the Puritans and pilgrims that we think of coming over to America, both in Plymouth and in Boston. They were Congregationalists. Sometimes we call them Puritans. I guess they were a type of Puritan, but Technically, they were Congregationalists. The freedom to read and try and interpret the Bible led to many interesting interpretations. There were people at that time that felt that Christ's second coming and the millennium were not far off on the horizon. And they went through Old Testament prophecies, trying to plug in modern leaders at that time into the different characters that were talked about in the prophecies. Others of them felt that Christ's church had died with the apostles and that there would need to be a restoration of what had been in the New Testament. Some of them thought that would occur after the millennium. There were big divergencies on how to interpret these things, just like there are today. At this point, I think it would be important to touch a little bit upon the lives of some of the important people during the Protestant Reformation, kept it moving forward, and also had profound influence upon the colonies, and even on us today. The first person I'll mention is a man named Isaac Watts, an Englishman, who lived from 1674 to 1748. Watts is credited with writing some 750 hymns. Many of them appear in modern hymn books today. If you go to church and look through your hymn book, you might see some of the songs he wrote. The more famous ones include, He died, the great Redeemer died, Sweet is the work, From all that dwell below the skies, Great God, attend while Zion sings, Our God, our help in ages past, Praise ye the Lord, With all the power of heart and tongue, Come, We That Love the Lord, and probably his most famous song was a modern Christmas carol that we still sing today called Joy to the World. Another important person that I want to say a word or two about is a man named Charles Wesley. He lived from 1707 to 1788. He wrote several important hymns that are still in our hymn books today, such as Jesus, Lover of My Soul, Rejoice the Lord is King, Ye Simple Souls Who Stray, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Come Let Us Anew, and the important Christmas carol that we sing every year, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Charles Wesley had an even more famous brother named John Wesley. Both John and Charles Wesley were part of a club at Oxford University that held meticulously to a schedule of scripture reading, fasting, communion, and doing good works for the poor. They were so meticulous about this that others derisively called them names, including Methodists, because of the rigorous methods they used. This name stuck, and even to this day, the Methodist denomination is well known both in England and in Europe. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, but he was also a very good preacher. Sometimes he was denied admission to preach in some of the churches, so he'd simply preach out in the fields. On one occasion, he preached to a crowd of many thousands of people, even standing upon the grave of his own father doing so because he was denied permission to enter the church and preach in there. So he preached out in the church graveyard. John Wesley was invited to come and do missionary work in the new colony of Georgia, where he attempted to do missionary work among the Indians. Apparently things didn't go very well. He ended up leaving the Indians in disillusionment. He was angry at them. He claimed that they were gluttonous, thieves, liars, and murderers. While in Georgia, John Wesley had an affair with a woman named Sophie Hopke, who he hoped to marry. But unfortunately for him, Sophie married someone else. He was apparently quite angry at her and barred her from Holy Communion when she came to church, where he was the acting priest. Sophie's new husband was so outraged at how he had defamed his wife's character that he sued him in the court, and it ended up being quite a fiasco for John Wesley. John Wesley finally left Georgia and went back to England. He wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? So for a time there, I think he had some difficulty and struggles with what had happened to him in Georgia. The last person I'll mention is a man, a Frenchman named John Calvin, who lived from 1509 to 1564. Calvin had fled France in persecution there and fled to Geneva, Switzerland, where he did a lot of his work. 
Calvin's reading of the scripture convinced him that God as sovereign of the universe had predestined some people for salvation. This contrasted sharply with many of the teachings of other Protestant reformers, such as Martin Luther, who felt that people were justified by grace. Calvin's influence was far-reaching. He greatly influenced the way that Protestantism unfolded in England, and it was carried directly to the American colonies. The Puritans who settled Plymouth and Massachusetts were strongly Calvinistic in their beliefs and viewpoints. We've been talking a lot about the religious things that were going on during this time, but it's very important that we talk about an equally important intellectual revolution that was occurring during the Reformation called the Age of Reason. The Age of Reason had profound impacts upon the American founding fathers and upon colonial society in general. By the late 1600s, people were much more free to think for themselves. Many of them concluded that human reason was enough to lead people in the right way and that people could arrive at truth through honest inquiry. Many people, particularly intellectuals, began questioning all of the religions of the day and even the Bible itself, and many of these became atheists. Other intellectuals who believed in God had to find a way to harmonize their beliefs about God with their ability to reason, and their result was a belief system about God that we call deism. Deism is not so much a religion as it is an intellectual approach to belief in God. One of the analogies that is used to explain deism is the clock analogy. A deist might compare God to a great clockmaker who created the universe, wound it up and set it in motion, and then simply moved on to other projects and was no longer involved in the universe that we know of anyway. One of the most important founding fathers that was a deist was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was extremely intellectually gifted, but he believed that the Bible had been tempered with, and he also had problems believing many of the myths and creeds that he saw in religion at his time. In his own writings, he regarded himself as a Christian, but he had deep misgivings about the beliefs, doctrines, and denominations of Christianity in his time. In talking about the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the doctrine that still underlies Catholicism and the vast majority of Protestant denominations today, Thomas Jefferson had this to say about it. The hocus-pocus phantasm of a god, like another Cerberus with one body and three heads, had its birth and growth in the blood of thousands and thousands of martyrs. In fact, the Athanasian paradox that one is three and three but one is so incomprehensible to the human mind that no candid man can say he has any idea of it. And how can he believe what presents no idea? He who thinks he does only deceives himself. He proves also that man, once surrendering his reason, has no remaining guard against absurdities the most monstrous, and like a ship without rudder, is the sport of every wind, with such person's gullibility, which they call faith, takes the helm from the hand of reason, and the mind becomes a wreck. I write with freedom, because while I claim a right to believe in one God, if so my reason tells me, I yield as freely to others, that of believing in three. Jefferson's intellectual and deistic approach to religion got him in trouble. In fact, when he ran for president in 1800, he was accused of being an atheist. But deism also influenced many of the other founders. For example, George Washington, although technically he was a member of the Church of England, he also had many strong deistic viewpoints and ideas. In fact, in none of his letters or correspondence does George Washington ever mention the name of Jesus Christ. So I suppose it was possible to be a member of one religion and still have deistic views, and deism did heavily influence the founding fathers of our country. The lines in the Declaration of Independence about God and nature's God are very deistic in their viewpoints. Deism also heavily influenced John Locke, who in turn heavily influenced the founders of our nation. At this point, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of survey the colonies and see which religious denominations prevailed in which regions of the country. We start with the southern colonies, since Virginia was the first colony founded. Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia all had the Church of England as their official established religion. They also had laws in the book requiring you to attend Sabbath day services in those churches. The middle colonies of Pennsylvania and New Jersey were heavily Quaker in their influence and settlement. William Penn, who owned Pennsylvania as the proprietor of the colony, was Quaker himself, and he wished Pennsylvania to be a haven for persecuted Quakers and other Protestants who needed to come there. New York, which is in kind of a category all of its own, was first founded and settled by the Dutch, so the Dutch Reformed Church was always an important factor there. But after New York was taken over by the English, the Church of England became the officially established church there as well. The New England colonies of Connecticut, Massachusetts, Plymouth, and New Hampshire were all Congregationalist, or Puritan as we would say. Rhode Island was kind of unique among the New England colonies. So many dissenters from the surrounding colonies went there 
that Rhode Island had to have tolerance for religious diversity. This frustrated the neighboring New England colonies. They had very harsh things to say about Rhode Island and her willingness to accept dissenting viewpoints. But in a way, Rhode Island kind of foreshadowed what would happen throughout the rest of the country someday. In order to get along, they had to tolerate each other's opinions. Maryland was the only colony founded by Catholics. The Baltimores, who were Catholics, wanted to set up a haven for persecuted Catholics in the New World. But Maryland was soon flooded by Protestant colonists from England, and before long, the Catholics there were a small minority. In order to get along, Lord Baltimore had to practice religious tolerance as well. This is only a general sketch. I think in just about every colony you would find people of many different faiths, but I only described here what religious persuasions dominated in each. Throughout the colonies, you found a heavy sprinkling of Presbyterians, Lutherans, and other Protestant denominations. In earlier podcasts, I've mentioned how little the mother country attempted to regulate affairs in the colonies. Each colony was very much its own independent little country. This is especially true when it came to religion. It is true that the Bishop of London was officially appointed to oversee the spiritual affairs of the colonies, but really nothing happened from that, and there was really no authority to do much either. The colonies did not have an Anglican bishop here. In England, an Anglican bishop was an imposing figure. They had important social and political powers, not just religious ones as well. There's always been a discussion about what would have happened had the king attempted to establish an Anglican bishopric in the colonies. Anglicans tended to be more loyal to the king, and maybe the War of Independence might not have happened had that been the case, but it's hard to determine that. I'm sure if they had tried to set up a bishopric in anywhere in New England, it would have caused riots and outrage and mob activity. It's very ironic that the Church of England, which was the official church in England, had very little say over what happened in the colonies, and sometimes her clergy and members were even persecuted in the colonies that practiced congregationalism, such as in New England. It was very difficult, too, to have qualified priests of the Anglican Church that were willing to come over to the colonies to preach. And since there was no bishop here, they had to be ordained in England, which made things more difficult. Many of them that did come here complained about the low salary, and many of the colonists complained about the low quality of them as well. Religious affairs in each colony were pretty much regulated and governed by the governor and the colonial legislatures in each colony. It would have been illegal for one preacher to go from one colony to another preaching from here and there. These were called itinerant preachers. Normally, you had to have a license to preach in each colony. And of course, that wouldn't have been tolerated to go from one colony to another preaching or trying to set up your own church. For example, in Virginia, Presbyterians and Baptists attempted to set up churches there during the colonial period, and they were persecuted and treated pretty poorly. The preachers that didn't have licenses to preach were thrown in jail. As I mentioned earlier, religion and politics and government were all intertwined at this time. So if you came to one place and started preaching something different than what they already had established, you were not only changing religious opinions, you were also changing the political and social order there as well. It's important to note, too, that all of the colleges that were initially founded in the colonies, such as Harvard, Yale, and the college we now call Columbia, and many others were founded initially as colleges designed to train clergymen. Between 1700 and 1775, about 85,000 people from southwestern Germany, neighboring Switzerland, and France came to the colonies. Many came for religious freedom, but not all. The English government had a policy of welcoming Protestants from Germany, and the colonial governments themselves welcomed having these people settle into the back country where they could act as a buffer between the settlements on the coast and the Indians of the interior. The vast majority of these Germans settled in Pennsylvania, but still a few others did settle and move farther south into the back country of the Carolinas, where they founded colonies and settlements such as Wachovia. Sadly, a high proportion of the Germans that came over weren't able to pay their debts, and many of them were sold into servitude till they could pay their debts off. A few of these Germans were followers of a man named Menno Simons. Today we know them as Mennonites. Also scattered throughout the colonies were a few Jews here and there. These were never very large in number, but by about the time of the Revolution, they probably numbered close to 3,000 people. Life for Jews in medieval Europe had not been easy. In England, they were considered infidels, so they were kind of at the mercy of the king. They weren't given any civil protections of any kind. So the kings of England were free to extort from them or to leave them alone as they chose. One story about King John, he was attempting to extort a loan from a wealthy Jewish man, and the king declared that for every day this Jewish man delayed giving him the loan, he would lose a tooth. That just gives you an idea of kind of how they were treated. So life was very uncertain for them. And unfortunately, many of the laws and concepts that were in England carried forward into the colonies. As a general statement, I think it's probably true that sometime after 1700 or so or thereabouts, the Jews began to have a little easier time. I think they were fairly well tolerated, although it would be some time before they would get their civil rights 
and it was kind of on a colony, later state-by-state basis. From the late 1720s to about the 1740s, both England and the colonies were the scene of a vigorous religious revival known as the Great Awakening. This revival was in part a backlash against the secularism that was such a part of the Age of Reason. It was also a response to the deadness and the boringness of the sermons and the dry, stale, moralistic teachings that were going on in so many of the religious denominations at that time. The Great Awakening featured fiery, zealous preachers who traveled from town to town, preaching with passionate voices and calling for repentance in a fiery style. The Great Awakening swept the colonies like a storm, and it foreshadowed the religious revivals that were such a part of the 1800s American religious life. The most famous of these fiery new preachers was a man named George Whitfield, who was an Anglican priest. Whitfield was born in 1714. During the 34 years of his preaching, he preached an estimated 18,000 sermons, and he said, May I die preaching. He truly belonged behind a pulpit. As early as age 24, George Whitfield was preaching to crowds as large as 80,000 people in England. Whitfield made seven trips to the colonies, where he preached in every single colony, When Whitfield preached in Philadelphia, Ben Franklin published his sermons and preachings. Franklin wrote, I computed that he might well be heard by more than 30,000. This reconciled me to the newspaper accounts of his having preached to 25,000 people in the fields. Whitfield preached in a fiery, passionate style, which may have been a preview to the kinds of fiery, passionate sermons we hear from evangelicals in modern times as well. One witness who attended one of his sermons wrote, I could hardly bear such unreserved use of tears and the scope he gave to his feelings, for sometimes he exceedingly wept, stamped loudly and passionately, and was frequently so overcome that for a few seconds you would suspect he never could recover, and when he did, nature required some little time to compose herself. I hardly ever knew him to go through a sermon without weeping more or less, and I truly believe his tears were of sincerity." Although Whitfield was an Anglican priest, he cared little for denominational differences. What people believed was more important to him. He was often very critical of his fellow priests, accusing them of not being converted themselves and therefore unfit to preach. And of course, this garnered him some opposition. One of the reasons that he had to begin preaching outdoors was because he was barred from entering some of the churches where the local priests were angry at him. On other occasions he was preaching, people would throw rotten eggs, dirt, rocks, and even pieces of dead cats at him. On one occasion, a band of trumpets and drums was hired to try and drown him out while he preached. If these weren't bad enough, on other occasions, he was even physically beaten up, and there were even assassination attempts on his life. The Great Awakening was probably one of the most important developments in American colonial history. It also demonstrated that some of the earlier rigidness that went on in the colonies was now starting to break down. In the 1600s, such a Great Awakening never could have occurred in the colonies. No minister would have been allowed to travel from colony to colony, preaching here and there as itinerant preachers. I think by the middle, if not a little earlier, of the 1700s, English society, including the colonies, was getting used to the idea of being tolerant. There were so many denominations that it was impossible now for any one group to rigidly dominate the political powers, and they simply got used to tolerating each other. Before the Constitution was even thought of, many of the Founding Fathers had been fighting for religious tolerance in their states. George Washington's sentiments on this topic, which I think were pretty much the same as all the rest of them, were these. He wrote, Of all the animosities which have existed among mankind, those which are caused by a difference of sentiments and religion appear to me to be the most inveterate and distressing and ought most to be deprecated. I was in hopes that the enlightened and liberal policy which has marked the present age would at least have reconciled Christians of every denomination so far that we should never again see the religious disputes carried to such a pitch as to endanger the peace of society. The Constitution has a clause in it that says, No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Not everyone is happy about this, though. Some of the people, especially in the New England states, thought that groups that were hostile to Christian religions might someday gain power and start persecuting the other religions. After the Constitution was ratified and George Washington was elected our first president, he received an interesting number of letters from different groups around the country who had been persecuted. The letters and his responses to them are very interesting. The Baptists, who had been persecuted in backstate Virginia, and Washington was familiar with these persecutions, sent a letter to Washington saying, When the Constitution first made its appearance in Virginia, we as a society had unusual strugglings of mind, fearing that the liberty of conscience dearer to us than property or life was not sufficiently secured. 
Perhaps our jealousies were heightened on account of the usage that we received under the royal government when mobs, bonds, fines, and prisons were our frequent attendants. But amidst all the inquietudes of our mind, our consolation arose from this consideration. The plan must be good, for it bears the signature of a tried, trusty friend, and if religious liberty is rather insecure, the administration will certainly prevent all oppression, for a Washington will preside. Washington responded in a letter to the Baptist, writing, If I could have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, certainly I would never have placed my signature to it. The Quakers also sent Washington a congratulatory letter. They had suffered during the Revolution because many suspected the Quakers of being Tory sympathizers because they wouldn't take up arms against the British. In his response, Washington wrote back to the Quakers saying, Government being, among other purposes, instituted to protect the persons and consciousnesses of men from oppression, it is certainly the duty of rulers not only to abstain from it themselves, but according to their stations, to prevent it in others. Your principles and conduct are well known to me, and it is doing the people called Quakers no more than justice to say that except their declining to share with others the burden of the common defense, there is no denomination among us who are more exemplary and useful citizens. The Presbyterians in Massachusetts also sent Washington a letter. They had no objection to the clause in the Constitution prohibiting religious tests. However, they wrote, We should not have been alone in rejoicing to have seen some explicit acknowledgement of the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent inserted somewhere in the Magna Carta of our country. Washington, who probably wasn't too thrilled about the idea of inserting religious themes in the Constitution, responded to the Presbyterians in a letter saying, to the guidance of the ministers of the gospel, this important object is, perhaps more properly committed, it will be your care to instruct the ignorant and to reclaim the devious, and in the progress of morality and science, to which our government will give every furtherance, we may confidently expect the advantage of true religion and the completion of our happiness. One of the more interesting letters sent to the new president came from a congregation of Jews. They wrote to him, Deprived as we have been hitherto of the invaluable rights of free citizens, we now behold a government which to bigotry gives no sanction, to persecution no assistance, but generously affording to all liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship, deeming every one of whatever nation, tongue, or language equal parts of the great governmental machine, for all the blessings of civil and religious liberty which we enjoy under an equal and benign administration, we desire to send up our thanks to the Ancient of Days. In his response, Washington wrote, The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by some the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights, for happily the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. Church History in Plain Language by Bruce L. Shelley. Radical Puritans in England, 1550 to 1660 by R.J. Atchison. The English Reformation, 1530 to 1570, by W. J. Shields. Heretics and Believers, A History of the English Reformation, by Peter Marshall. How We Got the Bible, by Lynette Hadley Reed. The Religious History of America, by Edwin Gausted and Lee Schmidt. The Evangelistic Zeal of George Whitfield, by Stephen J. Lawson. Hopeful Journeys. German Immigration, Settlement, and Political Culture in Colonial America, 1717-1775, by Aaron Spencer Fogelman. The Life and Selected Writings of Thomas Jefferson, edited by Arianna Koch and William Pedden. The Church of England as the Established Church in 17th Century Virginia, by William H. Seller, published in the Journal of Southern History, Volume 15, Number 4, November 1949. Religion and Authority, Problems of the Anglican Establishment in Virginia in the Era of the Great Awakening and the Parsons' Cause, by Rise Isaac, published in the William & Mary Quarterly, Volume 30, Number 1, January 1973, 
The Church of England and Religious Liberty at Pre-Revolutionary Yale by Lewis Leonard Tucker, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 17, Number 3, July 1960. Religious Conditions Among German-Speaking Settlers in South Carolina, 1732-1774 by Gilbert P. Voigt, published in the South Carolina Historical Magazine, Volume 56, Number 2, April 1955. Church and State in the Early Years of the Massachusetts Bay Colony by Aaron B. Seidman, published in the New England Quarterly, Volume 18, Number 2, June 1945. George Washington and Religious Liberty by Paul F. Bowler, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 17, Number 4, October 1960. George Whitfield, Dissenter Priest of the Great Awakening, 1739 to 1741, by William Howland Kenny III, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 26, Number 1, January 1969, and Civil Status of the Jews in Colonial New York, by Max J. Kohler, published by John Hopkins University, in the publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, Number 6, 1897.